வணக்கம் when we compare the swarnick deformity and the butonian deformity definitely the problems of function are more in the swarnick deformity but the butonian deformity also has its own unique problems in this video we shall see about these problems how the butonian deformity is caused and what are all the conditions in which the butonian deformity occurs and how it can be treated we shall learn all about the butonier deformity under the headings of introduction pathoanatomy the etiology clinical findings and staging and the management the butonier deformity refers to deformity of the finger with flexion at the proximal interphalangeal joint and hyperextension at the distal interphalangeal joint the word butonier is derived from the french word for button hole flower actually it denotes the flower that's placed in the button hole of the coat lapel this button hole is supposed to be similar in shape to the defect that is seen intraoperatively when a butonier deformity is explored as you can see in this surgical picture where the shape of the defect that is seen over the proximal interphalangeal joint resembles somewhat the button hole if there is only a pip joint flexion contracture and no dip joint hyperextension it is referred to as a pseudo butonier before we try to understand the pathoanatomy of how the butonier deformity develops let us see one important point the swarnick deformity can be caused by a problem in the metacarpophalangeal joint a problem in the proximal interphalangeal joint or a problem in the distal interphalangeal joint but as far as the butonier deformity is concerned it can be caused only by a problem at the level of the proximal interphalangeal joint at this level that is the proximal interphalangeal joint there are three forces acting on the extensor side the central slip the lateral bands and the retinacular ligaments all the changes that are going to occur in the butonier deformity are going to occur at these three structures mainly when there is an injury to the central slip as in trauma it leads to flexion at the pip joint because most of the extensor force on the dorsal aspect of the pip joint is lost so now all the forces are diverted through the lateral bands to the distal interphalangeal joint which gets hyperextended due to the additional forces of extension in this position the retinacular ligaments both the transverse retinacular ligament and oblique retinacular ligaments are in a shortened position which of course in due course of time get contracted subsequently the lateral bands slip volar to the proximal interphalangeal joint axis and hence they stop being extensors of the pip joint and become flexors of the pip joint because of their position being volar to the axis so now the butonier deformity is well established all this has been caused by injury to the central slip in trauma this same injury to the central slip can also occur in pip joint arthritis as in rheumatoid arthritis and central slip attenuation can also occur following burns of the hand especially on the dorsal aspect commonly the butonier deformity can occur following trauma burns or rheumatoid arthritis clinically though we can see the characteristic deformity in the finger we need to check the passive range of movements at the proximal interphalangeal and distal interphalangeal joints too there are two tests that need to be done the elson test and the haines zancoli test so there are two components of the elson test first we test the active extension of the proximal interphalangeal joint against resistance and while the patient is extending the proximal interphalangeal joint we check the tone of the distal interphalangeal joint which should be free and flail if the central slip is intact if the central slip has been injured or attenuated the dip joint will appear rigid when this test is done the next test to be done 
is the Haynes Zancoli test. Here the PIP joint is held in neutral position and the DIP joint is passively flexed by the examiner. If the distal interphalangeal joint does not flex passively, it means that either the joint capsule or the retinacular ligaments are tight. On putting the PIP joint passively into flexion, if the DIP joint is now able to be flexed passively, it indicates that the retinacular ligaments are tight and the joint capsule is lax. This test, if positive, signifies that conservative management may not be useful. If left untreated, the boutonniere deformity can develop complications like chronic joint stiffness, re-injury or re-dislocation, post-traumatic arthritis, and decreased range of motion. Burton has classified the boutonniere deformity into four clinical stages. Stage 1, where the proximal interphalangeal joint is supple and passively correctable. Stage 2, where there is a fixed contracture of the proximal interphalangeal joint but with contracted lateral bands and tight DIP joint. In stage 3, there is a fixed contracture, joint fibrosis, collateral ligament and palmar plate contractures and in stage 4, along with the features of stage 3, PIP joint arthritis is also present. Though the boutonniere deformity does not lead to as much loss of function as occurs in a swan neck deformity, yet it requires management since the range of movements of the fingers are grossly restricted. The management can either be non-operative or operative. In the acute boutonniere deformity too, non-operative management is significant. We need to splint the proximal interphalangeal joint in full extension for 6 weeks. This can be done for acute closed injuries up to 4 weeks following injury. At the same time, we should encourage active distal interphalangeal joint extension and flexion with the splint preventing flexion at the proximal interphalangeal joint. This is done to avoid contraction of the oblique retinacular ligament. Night splinting should be continued for 6 weeks after this 24 by 7 splinting of the PIP joint. In chronic boutonniere, the splints that can be applied are static or dynamic. The static splint is the same that is used for acute boutonniere injuries also. This splint allows the lateral bands to realign themselves and helps to stretch out the tight transverse retinacular ligaments, resulting in correction of the deformity despite the central slip insufficiency. The dynamic splint, otherwise known as the Kapner splint, is a spring wire three-point extension splint which has a small force to hold the DIP joint in extension. So the patient has to flex the distal interphalangeal joint against resistance. Apart from the splints, therapy is also very important for the correction of the boutonniere deformity. First, the therapist places his index finger over the extensor aspect of the proximal interphalangeal joint and tries to bring it to neutral position as far as possible. At the same time, the therapist supports the flexor aspect of the terminal phalangeal region and keeps the distal interphalangeal joint in extension. When the PIP joint comes to neutral position, there is hyperextension at the distal interphalangeal joint in a boutonniere deformity. The patient must now actively flex the distal interphalangeal joint. The operative management of the boutonniere deformity can be done in the acute boutonniere and the chronic boutonniere deformities. In the acute boutonniere, a primary central band repair is done when there are open wounds with the central slip injury and even in acute displaced avulsion fractures. For details about the management of the acute boutonniere, please click on the icon above. In the chronic boutonniere deformity, we need to remember that deformities of 30 degrees or less at the PIP joint are quite difficult to improve with surgery. And before embarking on any surgical management of a chronic boutonniere deformity, we need to remember Burton's seven principles. It must be done by a person experienced in surgery on the hand. It is rarely to be performed in a supple deformity because therapy forms the keystone management. 
If at all surgery needs to be done, it needs to be run only after the joints have become soft and supple. Pre-operative and post-operative exercise program must be followed diligently. If there are arthritic changes on X-ray, implant arthroplasty or PIP fusion must be thought of as an ancillary procedure. We should not jeopardize flexor function in an attempt to gain extension. Procedures are done either to decrease the tone at the distal interphalangeal joint or increase the tone at the proximal interphalangeal joint. There are basically only six procedures that are done to correct a chronic boutonniere deformity. They are release of the retinacular ligaments, extensor tenolysis, distal tenotomy, lateral band relocation, tendon reconstruction and PIP fusion or arthrodesis. Release of the retinacular ligaments refers to releasing the tightness of the transverse and oblique retinacular ligaments. Extensor tenolysis refers to freeing the tight extensor expansion from the additions, especially from the middle and distal aspects of the proximal phalanx. Distal tenotomy consists of actually surgically creating a mallet finger. This will decrease the extensor tone at the distal interphalangeal joint allowing the distal interphalangeal joint to flex in advanced cases of boutonniere deformity. It will also permit the extensor mechanism to slide proximally to increase the extensor tension at the proximal interphalangeal joint. There are two techniques of distal tenotomy. The dolphin technique where the tenotomy is a little more proximal and the Fowler's tenotomy which is a little more distal. But both tenotomies divide the extensor apparatus over the middle phalanx. A longitudinal incision is made over the middle phalangeal region, the extensor apparatus dissected out and an oblique tenotomy done. The procedure of lateral band mobilization and relocation is done to bring the lateral bands back to the dorsal position from their dislocated volar position and securing them on the dorsal aspect by suturing them to the central slip. Reconstituting the gap in the central slip to achieve active PIP joint extension is also a technique for correction of chronic boutonniere. This gap in the central slip can be reconstructed by any of the three possible methods. Mate uses both lateral bands, Haywood uses one lateral band and Littler again uses both lateral bands for the reconstruction. Finally, the technique of PIP joint fusion which is done whenever there is evidence of arthritis in the PIP joint. All the techniques that we have seen have been integrated into what is known as the Curtis staged reconstruction of boutonniere deformity. Here there is a staged redistribution of forces in a step by step fashion to attain a more anatomically functional finger. In the first step or stage 1 of the surgery, a lazy S incision is made over the PIP joint and the transverse retinacular ligament is freed distally and proximally and a tenolysis of the extensor tendon is done. If full extension is achieved by this step, the operation stops. If full extension has not been achieved, we go on to the second step that is, we section the transverse retinacular ligament. This allows the lateral bands to swing dorsally and this is followed up with splinting and exercises. But even if after that stage there is still a 20 degree or lesser lag, the step 3 or stage 3 is done where a Fowler's tenotomy is performed. Either a step cut lengthening of the lateral bands to prevent an overt mallet finger or an oblique cut of the extensor can be done. Now, if full extension is present, the operation stops. But if the extensor lag is still present, the central tendon is dissected free and advanced about 4 to 6 mm into a drill hole in the dorsal base of the middle phalanx. The lateral bands now slack are sutured to the central tendon. At the end of every single step, if the extension has been achieved, the procedure is stopped a K-wire is passed across the proximal interphalangeal joint to maintain full extension during the early post-operative period and the distal interphalangeal joint is left free and active motion of this joint is allowed. There are four salient points to remember. 
regarding the operative management of the chronic boutonniere deformity. We must exhaust all splint protocols before planning for a surgical correction. And if we do plan surgery, we must ensure a full passive range of movements at the proximal interphalangeal joint. But we must remember that even after surgery, there may be a 20 degree persistent extensor lag at the PIP joint. And we must never trade getting extension at the PIP joint at the cost of losing the flexor function. I hope you liked the video. I enjoyed making it. Please click on the shown links to see more about other zones of extensor tendon injury and their management. And do not forget to subscribe to stay connected with the latest in learning hand surgery, plastic surgery and trauma surgery. Manakkam.